Okay, we're going to get started. I know, exactly. Where's that bell from last night? <laughs> yeah, Eric, you should have brought that bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where's the chimes again? <laughs> okay, well, we have had just a great morning so far. Um, what a great, thank you, Bob, wherever you went. Um, that was awesome. I think that um, I learned a lot from that presentation. And it really sets us up for where we're going this afternoon. The quote that Rob Johnstone had in there about community colleges being structured to get the kind of results that we're receiving is spot on. And I can tell you from the work that Clark has been doing is that we're not going to stand by and allow that to happen. And our next presentation is on advanced manufacturing. And advanced manufacturing is going to be uh, one of the flagship programs here at Clark College at Boshma Farm. And we're not gonna stand by and allow us to have those kind of results. We need it for Clark, we need it for our students, and we need it for this community in this region. This is where things are going and we are so excited to be in a position that we can truly change the path of this region and what and our role within it. In the state of Washington, we have some major companies, and so think of what we can do for Southwest Washington. So I'm happy to introduce this morning one of our board members, Brad Skinner. And Brad came to us. We, we actually went out and recruited Brad, who had been working with Kevin Witt. And Brad was important to us because we knew that we were kind of going down this path of manufacturing. And we knew this man had been successful over and over and over again. What I didn't know was the impact that he would make and how quickly he has made it. I can tell you that he is in our on office constantly and he is such a wonderful presence. Uh, he gently reminds us of things that we need to get done for him. <laughs> and thank you for being that, um, that force behind us. I can tell you that what he has produced to date, you are going to find is miraculous. I'm super excited about this particular project within our campaign and within our college. I didn't know much about manufacturing, but I'm learning quickly. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad to inspire us about where we're going. Thank you, Lisa. Um, one of the things I want to uh, make clear before I even start is what I'm going to say today is sort of a compilation that we've been working on for about a year with uh, Tim Cook in instruction, with many of you as foundation members, with some of the trustees. And so everything I'm about to say to you is, is very deliberate because it's reflective of instruction and Kevin Witt on economic and community development. Both of those big arms of the college are gonna succeed wildly, we believe, because of this program. So during this part of the program, I just wanna share what we have learned and discuss the potential opportunity for Clark College. Last night, you received a little preview of some of those concepts and in the next 90 minutes, we want you to understand the issues that will affect the lives of everyone in this room. And, uh, and then to build, we hope, on a relevant, lasting, and continually improving legacy for our students, both degreed and certified, with industrial skills and competencies required to compete in this world and in this world that has experienced the fourth industrial revolution today. Clark is uniquely positioned to pursue that kind of focus and complements its basic mission. I, was, I saw or I read or heard Bob talk about guidance, guiding all those issues to create more uh, strength and viability. 
uh, to, to help learners excel uh, to really achieve their educational and professional goals. And this program fits right into that entire process. Um, Kevin Witt and I began this project um, and worked on it for about the last 15 months. Uh, we had known one another through a training program which Clark conducted with the Greenbrier companies at the Gunderson plant in Portland. Gunderson had automated much of their production, which caused revenues and profits to increase, which you would think would happen. But another thing happened, because it was the most efficient provider of rail cars in the world, and in this continent and the Western Hemisphere, it also allowed the plant to maintain its workforce and to grow it because of its efficiency. I joined the Clark College Foundation board in March and began to work with Kevin and with Tim Cook. We outlined a series of questions that needed to be answered and identified companies that were pursuing automation, machine learning, start, smart manufacturing, deep uh, data applications, robotics, and building a foundation for artificial intelligence platforms. So we went out to try to find all those companies and there's many more since uh, that initial process. We wanted to understand what these companies were doing to promote skills of the future and what a technician would look like in order to work for these companies in the future. Here's a list of the companies that we, we interviewed. Um, you can see it's a fairly broad group of folks uh, from in situ up the river, as well as now in Vancouver. Uh, we've talked to uh, Greenbrier, we've talked to Boeing, uh, certainly Siemens, the Siemens tag team is here this morning, and uh, you'll hear a lot from them. Uh, this was not an easy process. This took about, I'd say, eight to nine months just to get into the right level. Because you can talk to the upper management person and they'll, they'll tell you all the great things they're doing, but then when you ask them specifics, you've got to go down in an organization to find the people that are actually cataloging the skills, training the skills, identifying the people that can actually qualify. But one thread ran true through all of our interviews. All of the companies, and there's probably 20 more that we've inter interviewed since this time, are having difficulty finding skilled workers and suffer from a lack of available talents as schools are not teaching, according to them, the skills that they say they need. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that many of our regional and national manufacturing workforce will soon retire. Our conclusions were we reached through these 24 interviews and validated further with probably about 40 or 60 more local employers and regional employers. And here's what we have concluded. And I'm gonna literally read these. I won't read the rest of the slides, but just these next three slides because it truly is our consensus about what we have concluded. There exists an opportunity for Clark College to offer unique uh, underlying unique curriculum certificates, which will enhance transfer credits, certificate programs, two-year degrees, and short-term skill specific training, which could significantly increase enrollment through training and retraining of existing workers, placing students for unmet demand across all industry sectors. I want to stress here, degreed is one of the focus but also training of corporations and companies that need to reinvent themselves and retrain over the next decade, perhaps even sooner. The type of curriculum being discussed would produce student graduates and opportunities for middle-class sustainability and for promotability. And my emphasis there is on middle-class, not minimum wage. The curriculum would enhance the capability, marketability, and reputation of Clark's faculty and its administration. Point number four, the companies are in need of modern and advanced skill training, especially skills focused on short-term training, allowing their workforces to remain relevant and competitive. We believe they will invest with Clark to provide best-in-class hardware, machinery, software, through grants and joint venture projects. Said differently, these companies are willing to partner and make Clark the applied manufacturing center that it has always seeks and has sought to become. Funding from the state or contributions of the local community are no longer enough to keep up with these programs because the technology is changing so rapidly. 
and, and we just can't, uh, the local communities cannot afford uh, to keep up with those changes in terms of contributions. The next point, if done correctly, Clark would become a source for new employment and retraining of company workforces both locally and nationally using its competency and expertise to teach skills required during the next five to 10 years as companies remain, try to remain and will remain competitive. Next point, Clark could evolve as an incubator for multiple industries, not just one industry, not just one segment, but for multiple industries, which will require new tools and process skills. This kind of win-win initiative for students, faculty, and Clark's image, uh, joined with expanded broadband capability, which you'll learn more about this afternoon, can propel Clark's reputation with state-of-the-art laboratories and related training centers. And the last point we concluded is that this kind of transformational opportunity by which Clark County could impact and the wealth and the health of all of Clark County and its citizens in a multi-generational way. So how do we know that this change is happening? The world is, of work is rapidly changing. The impacts of change will be just as dramatic as the industrial revolutions of the past. This new revolution will be built on the digitization of our world in new and unanticipated ways that we can't even forecast at the moment. So let's spend a, a little bit of time talking about the past, how we got to where we are today and how it's going to impact our employment and our cultural uh, perspective of ourselves. So let's go back to 1905. You think about that, that's only 115 years ago, only. Life expectancy. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Life expectancy was 47 years of age for a white male. 14% of the homes had a bathtub. 8% had a telephone. There were 8,000 cars in the United States and 144 miles of paved road. The average wage in the United States was 22 cents an hour. 95% of all births occurred in the home. 90% of all doctors had no college education as most went to substandard medical schools, probably veterinary schools. 20% of the adults could not read or write. 6% of all Americans ever graduated from high school. 18% of all households had at least one domestic helper or servant. And you can understand why, because there was so much work to do without appliances. <laughs> when you think about those statistics, and they're really kind of hard to believe, the world in 1905 had already benefited from the first industrial revolution. And that change saw the transition from human strength and effort to mechanical strength driven by innovations uh, that would harness steam and water and fossil fuels, just the beginning of those fossil fuels process. The second industrial revolution, which impacted 1905 population, involved specialization and division of labor. It began, just began to produce electricity and the foundations for mass production. I remember my father telling me that in the 1930s, the Skinner House in Brush Prairie was one of the first to have electricity on 119th Street and on what is today 152nd Avenue. I don't know what it was called back then, maybe a dirt road. Uh, the Skinner children would view their home from a distance at night, spellbound by the wonderment of a glowing light bulb and the freedom it would eventually <clears throat> bring their lives and households. To this day, I'm impressed with that story of how the federal, federal government's commitment to electrify all parts of our nation would change our country, help win World War II, and solidify a path of prosperity for all citizens. The availability of electric power would change the 1905 households, producing over time movie theaters, modern factories during World War II, and then converting all of those factories into mass production processes that would produce hot water heaters, ranges, ovens, construction equipment, heating and air conditioning systems, radios, televisions, garbage disposals, record players, all advanced further by the space race in the 1960s and 70s that would enhance miniaturization. The spread of electricity at the beginning of the 20th century formed the foundation of a third industrial revolution in the part 
in the latter part of this century or last century. The digital revolution impact of the third is now driving a shift from mechanical analog world that we probably grew up with about 20, 30 years ago to a digital virtual world which will change everything. The third industrial revolution made possible products and services that would increase the efficiency and enjoyability of our lives while reducing costs not only in the United States but throughout the world. In the past, new technologies were able to leapfrog older ones, and that's what we're seeing today, as some more advanced economies are already experiencing the impacts of the fourth industrial revolution, while others are still experiencing the third. I can remember during the past 45 years seeing the transition from IBM 360 systems, which would occupy half of the basement of the Vancouver City Hall, to grander devices, utilizing massive storage to AS400s for distri distributed processing, seeing the transition from impact printers to inkjet printers and laser printers, and tablet computers the size of a pad of paper with the same power as that IBM 360 system in the 1960s. The fourth, this fourth industrial revolution is data-driven and marries and marries the virtual with the physical world, integrating what were isolated pockets of data and using data electronic connectivity to produce dominant digital platforms which are unpar with unparalleled power as global brands today. At the same time, the Industrial Revolution is putting innovation and power into the hands of everyday citizens with sufficient bandwidth who can truly invent new products and approaches. And that's the other flip side, is that because you don't need a $60 billion research and development center, if you can learn all of this and these skills, you can invent your own products. And you can do it in Clark College laboratories, quite frankly. And we'll talk more about that with the uh, Siemens tag team. Um, all parts of the fourth industrial revolution are integrating and instructing processes. And even more connectivity and data will be anticipated with the deployment of 3G on your telephones which Jason will discuss more um, after lunch. For better or for worse, all industrial revolutions produce winners and losers. Since 1955, 88% of the Fortune 500 companies listed then have disappeared, 88%. Back then, the average company was anticipated to last 75 years. Today, the average company or corporation will last about 15 years because the innovation and technology keeps training and some people choose to embrace it and some don't. And someone else knocks them out either locally, regionally, nationally, or globally. So look at me, uh, look with me at the list of those companies that, that were uh, big time 100 years ago. You can see them. Well, they were Steel, AT&T. These are names that we, some of us grew up with. And, uh, and then you look at 67 and then the transition to today. And the size of some of these companies are much bigger than, than the ones of previous years. Been a lot of, of focus on technology, a lot of expansion in efficiency. Um, the new jobs, however, that have been created since the last recession, and this is really important, require specialized study, training, or education. And the jobs being destroyed tend to focus on physical or routine tasks. Validated by our own research, and most recently by a report of the Human Resource Forum, all jobs, both now and in the future, will, re inquire, will require increasing levels of problem solving, join with integrated social and system skills. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that. There is an upward bias toward greater skills which will disproportionately affect older and lower income colleagues and those working in industries most prone to automation by new technologies. You can see the transition that's already occurring. If I look at an average company, and these are averages that uh, Forbes and Forum, uh, Fortune have done. If you look at the average company in 1960, there was, there was probably a founder or someone heading it, that person had an advanced degree. And then the next level of management, there are probably about two people. These are just 
proportional ratios. Two people with skilled degrees that helped that person uh, run the company. And then there were some real skills. There was an accountant or a bookkeeper or other skills in 1960. And those skill descriptions have changed into more complex jobs. And there were a bunch of people that probably had uh, less in high school or high school educations and they did all kinds of work. You know, they were out there on an assembly line, they did various things. That's 1960. Now, 60 years later, this is what we're seeing uh, by looking and traversing and all of the data we have about companies. There's still that person that finds the company, founds it and, and leads it. And there's some people working for that person Proportionally, there's that ratio. And then there's those skilled workers, but those skills are very different than the skills of 1960. They're more, more digital, they're more demanding, but there's not a lot of people doing a lot of manual brute force work anymore. There's one unskilled worker in that kind of a ratio. The changes that are, and the changes are also illustrated uh, by the Automation and Future Work sponsored by the Portland Business Alliance, which also included Southwest Washington, where this research really began in 2013. It's been uh, updated each year through 2017. And you can see some of their, their um, summaries of just who's going to be affected. But the most important part of this slide, and we can provide these slides to all of you later, but you can, you can see here, my little laser pointer, systems under $20 an hour. So we've got to figure out a way to get more skills into the hands of people that are attending places like Clark College and others so that they will have middle class jobs that will pay for themselves and for their future of their families going forward. The next slide illustrates who will likely be affected and you can see it's going to be, this is the state of Oregon, and pretty much the percentages are the same in almost all areas. Uh, there could be up to 49% of jobs affected. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's going to have to be a lot of retraining because the jobs are being redefined through technology. McKinsey and company says that, or they believe that uh, there'll be uh, an impact of 47% jobs disrupted or changed over the next decade with a net loss of 5%. Well, that's still pretty substantial if we lost 5% of all of our jobs. Uh, that's not good. But anyway, it's, it, it's a process that people are going through and that's why we believe there needs to be retraining and training set up in institutions like Clark, as well as for degreed, as well as for corporations and certificates. Go ahead with the next one. You can also see who, who is affected. The, the orange color Rick and I talk, you know, I can check into the Hilton Hotel without even talking to a person. You know, I can charge whatever I want, the restaurants, whatever, on my computer or my 